Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm Jenny Johnson, and I serve you as your president of the MCOA board this year. This is our annual members meeting where you will get an update on our performance for 2020 and a preview of 2021. You'll hear from Jay Harvey, our treasurer, and Susanna Johnston, our interim GM. A couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. Please use the Q&A box at the top or bottom of your screen to send us your questions as we go through the presentation. We will have time at the end to answer them. Put your name and address on your questions. We're taping this presentation to allow those members who could not be with us today to view it. It will be posted on our website by late tomorrow. Serving with me on the board this year are the eight other individuals in this picture. They have put in countless hours leading their committees in formulating policies and plans to move Moss Creek forward. I call your attention to the nominating committee, this year chaired by Skip Leonard. These representatives of the community will present to us their list of nominated board candidates in a few weeks. I want to thank our members who stepped up to serve on all the committees this year. The committees are the lifeblood of the community and, and where the most work gets done. And Moss Creek would not be the wonderful place we all enjoy without the talented, creative, hardworking staff. Please join me in thanking all these folks for their service. The elephant that's been in the room over the past year is named COVID. It has dramatically impacted all our lives from keeping us from visiting with family and friends to losing loved ones and suffering through the many restrictions of our activities, both here in Moss Creek and in the greater world. Today, we'll explore how Moss Creek has been handling the crisis and its financial impact, the effects on staff, the safety of our community, and plans for a return to normal or the next normal as I term it. First, let's talk about some of the things accomplished in 2020. We met or exceeded our overall financial goals, as you will hear about in detail from Jay later in this meeting. That was extremely good news. The board held up some capital spending early in the year until we could see how our finances fared. Towards summer, when it became apparent that we were gonna be okay due to careful spending, incredible real estate sales and a PPP loan, those projects, including pickleball, were put back on go. A modified dues and fees structure was put in place in, for 2021 to assure Moss Creek of a secure and stable financial structure going forward. The reserve fund is our savings account for repair and replacement of our physical assets such as the clubhouse, golf course, roads, and so on. That fund was reevaluated by an outside third party, as is our practice every three years, and our contribution was increased to cover the effects of inflation and updated assets. We worked with club benchmarking to further refine our capital spending plan to better allow us to manage investments and assets and keep our infrastructure up to date with member expectations in the competitive marketplace. While we did take out a PPP loan to ensure we could keep our well-respected staff employed during the COVID crisis, I'm happy to report that the loan was forgiven by the government in late December. The board adopted an updated strategic plan with an operational plan embedded. 
this gives Moss Creek a way to more quickly and efficiently um, adapt to requirements of the future members while being focused on providing wonderful member experience to our current members. Through member approved change in our bylaws, future updating of the strategic plan moves to the executive committee with an expanded group doing a more thorough review every three years. Additionally, members, the members passed by 72% changes to our bylaws that streamline our committee structure. I can assure you that under the new structure, our committees are getting more done and are better able to coordinate their efforts with other committees. We were also able to develop plans at the end of 2020 for the 2021 committees, a new tactic for Moss Creek, which allowed the 2021 committees to get moving a lot faster with coordinated goals that are in sync with the strategic plan and board goals. In 2020, the board approved the renovation of the clubhouse with a budget of 2.6 million, with 1.1 million of already set aside reserves and 1.5 million of new capital. The design work is progressing and we expect cost figures very soon. That limited budget does not cover any work on the veranda, which has proven to be very popular over the last year. According to construction industry data, building costs have increased between five and 6% a year since our last cost estimates. We've been told to anticipate a five to 6% increase in construction costs for each of the next four to five years. For example, lumber prices alone shot up 208% over the last 12 months. But read my lips, no extra increase in dues or any assessment due to the clubhouse project will be forthcoming. The new Mackey's Grill opened in June, 2020 to wildly positive reviews. Our community, community loves having a casual dining option down by the pool and marina with its water views. An expansion of its seating is already underway. As I mentioned earlier, the pickleball courts are off hold and now the work is underway. More on that later from Susanna. As part of our goal to improve communications with our membership, our 2021 membership survey was planned and implemented by the communications committee. You will be hearing the results from that survey later this month. Thank you to the 1100 plus members who took the time to answer the survey. The results of the survey will help shape the future of Moss Creek. And finally, there were many administrative goals that were met, which helped make operations more effective and efficient. We're fortunate to have such a strong management team who've been instrumental in both implementing the community goals while keeping us safe from COVID. Looking to our 2021 expectations, we see important features like implementation of actions as a result of that membership survey, a means to measure and track improvements in membership experience, completion of the clubhouse renovation, pickleball courts up and full, an improved financial position, a long-term infrastructure plan, implementation of the strategic plan, reserve plan, and capital plan, new committee structures, and an easing of COVID restrictions. Big agenda. As they say, the devil is in the details. So here to provide the financial details is Jay Harvey, our treasurer and chair of the finance committee. 
Jay. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, I don't know whether you were calling me the devil or saying that the details I'm providing are the devil, but I'll go either way. Um, as treasurer of your board, I wanted to uh, share with you an overview of what we're going to talk about this afternoon. I'll first give a summary of the roles of our finance committee and of the audit committee, and then share with you the members of each committee that, that volunteer their time and their expertise on our behalf. Then I'll give a summary of our financial health at the end of 2020. All of us realized that there were significant impacts from a health, social, and financial perspective from the COVID-19 virus. I will give you a snapshot of where we stand financially at, uh, at the end of the first quarter at the very end. So the responsibilities. Here is the description of the main responsibilities of the Finance Committee. I won't go through the list item by item, but I'll highlight the main ones. The focus of our Finance Committee is to ensure that the decisions and actions we make always support our mission, which is, quote, to provide an exceptional mix of services and amenities that enhance the appeal, value, and quality of life for our members, end quote. And while, while doing so, we have to make sure that we're protecting the assets of our association. A main responsibility for us is to closely monitor and review on a monthly basis, our financial performance versus budget. Should we discover variances or significant variances, it is our responsibility to advise the board if corrective action is required. Annually, we conduct a comprehensive review of our insurance policies and coverages and our employee benefit programs and to make recommendations for adjustment if necessary. We also monitor progress and expenditures for our capital projects to ensure that the performance is meeting our, the obligations. So our role also requires us to work closely with the facilities and infrastructure committee as it develops project plans and timelines for future capital projects. And finally, we analyze our financial projections and make uh, recommendations to the board regarding the 2022 budget. A special thanks to all the members of the Finance Committee for volunteering their time and expertise to the panel. We have a committee this year just steeped in knowledge and experience and I am delighted to work with such a capable and competent group. So thank you, Pat, Jan, Jack, Vince, Dale, John, and George, Jenny as an ex officio member, and of course, our general manager, John Miller, and controller, Payment Shamlu. As part of the uh, you know, financial stability is why uh, many of us uh, moved here in the first place, both the stability and the integrity that not Moss Creek is known for. So uh, we are very determined to make certain that these resources are carefully managed and utilized to assure that we may remain stable into the future. And as part of that process, the audit process, we contract with an independent audit firm to perform an annual review of our records. Now it's posted on the website. So posted on the website for you to look at are the audited financial statements for 2020. The objective of the audit is to obtain an independent assessment of Moss Creek's year-ending financial statements focusing on revenue, expenses, changes in membership equity, and cash flow. This, I'm pleased to announce that this year's audit concluded that our financial statements accurately reflect the financial position of the Moss Creek Owners Association. The audit process is supervised by Moss Creek, uh, by our audit committee, whose functions and duties are defined in our bylaw and policy statements. And again, many thanks to the volunteer members of this committee who share their expertise with our community. The 2021 audit committee was chaired by Chuck Eberly, and the 2122 committee is chaired by Dick Obrick. So thanks, you, Dick. Thank you, Lynn, Judy. Jim Winslow and Jim Panapinto. So of special note are the efforts of the Moss Creek accounting staff that works behind the scenes to make certain that all the financial statements and documentation are completed 
according to financial standards, accepted financial standards and announcements, and done so in a professional, responsive, and timely fashion. So a special thanks again to Payment Shamlu, our controller, and his very capable staff. So let's start with a couple simple definitions uh, to make sure we're all speaking the same language. Our operating income is the net of our revenue minus our expenses. And the revenue includes such items as our dues, activity fees, water oak utility payments, green fees, guest fees, cart rental, court usage, etc. And our expenses include our employee wages, benefits, insurance, lease, cost of goods sold, utilities, uh, and those kinds of expenses. Now, non-operating income is the money that is generated from certificate fees. Certificate fees that are paid when a property change hands. Non-operating expenses are generally interest payments. Reserve funding is the kitty that we stash money where we, we set it aside each year to cover our anticipated replacement costs of capital assets as they age. So if you take the total of our net operating income and our non-operating income, um, these are what are used to fund the reserve account, to pay down debt, and to fund new capital projects. So look at 2020, our operating results. As you can see, we're an $11 million business. The 2020 operating revenue totaled $10.8 million, which was lower by $414,000 compared to budget. Don't forget, the 2020 budget was set pre-COVID. On the expense side, we performed better than expected. Expenses totaled $10.1 million, $700,000 under budget. So the total operational surplus at year end was of three quarters of a million dollars. We use this operating surplus in addition to our non-operating income to pay debt, to contribute to our reserve funds, and to pay for additional projects and amenity enhancement. Now for non-operating. It's primarily driven, overwhelmingly driven, by certificate transfer fees on home sales. We experienced greater than anticipated home sales in 2020. How about that for an understatement? Certificate fee income generated by 132 home sales was higher by $2 million compared to budget. And although we had robust home sales in 2020, with non-operating revenues so dependent on home sales during any given year, this source of income is unpredictable, therefore less dependable and less reliable. Now let's look at total cash, the total results in cash. We experienced a surplus of $4.1 million, which was utilized to pay down debt and to fund our reserve requirements. In 2020, we also paid, paid off the last of our outstanding line of credit debt of 325,000, and we allocated nearly 1.4 million into the reserve fund. We invested a million in reserve, maintenance, and capital spending. And this was funded by the balance of our net income, reserve funds, and unrestricted cash. All right, year-end debt. Um, we paid off our line of credit, which had been borrowed 11 years ago to pay for the pool expansion and the fitness center. And that debt is now paid off. We have uh, an equipment loan of $1.7 million, um, which we will pay down over each of the next three years. And you'll see in the 2021 results, we've already made a good start on that. Now, our balance sheet certainly can and has in the past support much higher debt levels should the, the need arise. So I wanna talk a minute about the equipment loan. We purchase our golf maintenance equipment and our golf carts in lieu of leasing, leasing them. Well, why is that? Well, we realize a tax advantage by purchasing versus leasing. So here's how it works. We trade much of our golf course maintenance equipment and all of our golf carts every three years, we trade it in. 2019 was the year for that transaction. When we do so, we pay off the old loan and take out a new loan 
on a new with a new balance on the trade-in value of our equipment. By rotating our golf maintenance equipment, we realize a significant savings in ongoing maintenance. As you can imagine, older equipment requires substantial repairs, which over time become costly. All right, cash. We concluded the year in a very positive fashion from a cash perspective. As indicated, we have 4.1 million in unrestricted cash, 162,000 in restricted cash, and 4.8 million in the reserve fund for a grand total of just over $9.1 million. And we have prudently built this surplus ahead of what will be significant spend over the next four years on the clubhouse, our roads, and our golf course capital outlays. At year end, our total assets increased by $3 million and member equity increased by 2.8 million, an increase of 15%. We call it member equity. It's not your money, it's the associations. And it is, think of it as retained earnings. Two thousand and twenty one budget. So we considered the continuation of the pandemic through June of twenty twenty one in putting together the budget. Don't, so we had an impact last year from March through December, and we had to plan for it not ending on the fiscal year. So we planned for the first half to be impacted by COVID. Are we right? We'll find out. Uh, considering the effects of the pandemic for a half a year, our combined HOA fees with other revenue from items such as activity fee and cart fees and green fees, et cetera, are, we anticipate our total operating revenues are expected to amount again to 10.8 million. Budgeted expense for 2021 are 10.6 million compared to the 2020 budget of 10.8 million, a decrease of $20,000. And this reflects you know, what we recommended with the Finance Committee. There's no crystal ball. We try to predict as best we can with the data we have. Now on the non-operating side, the Finance Committee adopted a recommendation in 2020 to allocate $970,000 from HOA fees to non-operating revenues to mini minimize any potential shortfall in certificate income. It was a great concern that was such a big year in 2020, we won't have any inventory. For 2021. So this allocation and certificate income from property transactions and other non-operating revenues are budgeted at 2.2 million. Our total non-operating revenues reduced by interest expenses and other non-operating expenses result in an expected surplus of 2.1 million. Non-operating revenue is dependent on the number of property transactions during the year, as I said before, and we developed our budget in this area anticipating 60 certificate generating sales, which is in line with our long-term average sales per year. So our total operating and non-operating surplus is estimated at 2.3 million. So in summary for 2020, we've got a very strong balance sheet. We've had, we have total cash of over $9 million, including reserves and restricted cash. We have an adequate reserve account, but will still require new capital from operating surplus to fund our approved projects through the five-year financial plan. Our 2020 operating and non-operating income exceeded our budget. And bottom line again, member equity, not yours, increased by 15%. As far as 2021 results go for the first quarter, we've exceeded our budget net income by 443,000. We've had better than anticipated and budgeted real estate sales and combined with the allocation of a percentage of the HOA fees to non-operating, uh, it contributed to our first quarter non-operating net income. As of the first quarter of 2021, we had 582 activity fee members, uh, members and we had budgeted 546. We've had 28 real estate transactions. Our cash uh, balance is a little over 11 million and our debt related to our equipment loan is 1.2 million. In summary, through the first quarter of 2021, we have exceeded our financial budgets. We continue to monitor our financial results on a monthly basis and we'll make adjustments to meet our budgeted goals 
if it is deemed necessary. Thank you. Susanna. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I am Susanna Johnston and I'm serving as your interim general manager while John Miller is out on medical leave. Today marks approximately 13 months since we entered the pandemic phase of operations. Administration continues to review the CDC and South Carolina DHAC guidelines for safe operations as we review and revise our COVID operating regulations and work to continue to open up our amenities. I would like to thank the membership for their patience and understanding as we try to balance keeping you, the members, and our staff safe. As Jenny stated, in 2020, we were able to secure a loan for paycheck protection and keep our staff employed at a time when others were laying off. This enabled us to keep operations open, although restricted. Our amenity managers came up with creative ways to serve the membership and I commend all of our staff for continuing to come to work and service the membership during these uncertain times. Their dedication to Moss Creek and to member service has been tremendous. During 2020, we certainly saw the advantage to living in the South. Members were able to continue to golf, play tennis, go to the pool and fitness center, attend fitness classes, get food and beverage either in person or go to the clubhouse or at the new Mackey Creek Grill. Golf rounds were up 8,900 rounds over prior year. Tennis almost caught up with prior year usage, but remember the courts were closed for a while at the beginning of the pandemic. While tennis, fitness, and clubhouse activity were lower, the pool and fitness classes were certainly popular. There were 3,000 more member visits to the pool and 150 additional fitness classes offered with a total of over 1,000 more member class participation. And let's not forget the popular Mackey Creek Grill that opened in June 2020. We were able to keep the grill open longer in the season and there were almost 11,000 meals served out of that facility. Outside activities were definitely the place to be in 2020. While you were active in the amenity areas, staff was also finding creative ways to engage the membership. Thanks to the creativity of Melissa Shear, along with other staff, we were able to host some social distance events, themed dinner nights, arts and craft show, the very popular Halloween boo through and pumpkin carving contest, our first annual turkey trot, and obviously photos with Santa. Hannah Welch and the Clubhouse team were instrumental in setting up and hosting virtual wine dinners. All this speaks to the staff stepping up to create a better member experience, even with our mask on. Our member activity usage continues to be high in the first quarter. And as Jay mentioned, we have 582 members who signed up for the activity fee and others who are participating in their two month trial membership, others who are participating in daily fees. We anticipate another busy year in amenity usage. I wanna address MCOA's mask policy and current COVID restrictions I've, as I've had some questions. Last Thursday, the Beaufort County mask ordinance for unincorporated Beaufort County expired. At that time, MCOA requested that masks be worn in our facilities with the exception of the fitness center and entering the pavilion for fitness classes where they will still be required. The restrictions in place for those two facilities are staying the same. We feel that the fitness center, center is a very small facility where the type of activity is right for transmittal of the virus if members and staff are not careful. The state recommended guidelines for fitness centers still request temperature taking, limiting usage, spacing cardio equipment, and allowing time between usage to clean the equipment. Members who are not vaccinated should continue to wear masks in all of our facilities. At this time, we have asked staff to continue to wear masks. I meet with the management team weekly and we discuss the current guidelines and how we safely see moving toward the next hurdle of reopening. We're also reviewing the county vaccination and COVID infection rates. We believe that many of our residents have either received their vaccines or are in the process. With the availability of the vaccine now to all persons over 16, many of our members and staff are in the vaccine cycle. 
We anticipate being able to open up more areas like the pool and clubhouse as we move into May. Currently, the golf shop is offering the option of riding two to a cart and inquiring of the membership if they would be interested in bag storage if reopened. Tennis is mostly back to full operation. And by the end of the week, we will be unlocking the administration office. While the office has always been open for assistance, we've kept the doors locked to control the flow. We feel that we could safely open the office and request social distancing. As you can imagine, this has not been an easy time and all of our decisions have been made and are being made with working to keep the membership and staff as safe as possible. I thank you again for your patience and your support. Now I would like to update you on a few projects we have going on this year. Um, as Jenny mentioned, the Pickleball's uh, court project is up and going. We're in the permitting phase. Our engineering firm has submitted the stormwater drainage land disturbance permit applications to both state and local authorities in mid-March. We've been told this is a 60 to 90 day approval process for state approval. And just last week, we have received a local approval. In the meantime, we're continuing to move forward with also getting approval from the county staff review team for the project. Parallel to all this permitting phase, we will be going to bid with contractors for both the site work and actual court construction. Many of you may have noticed and been disrupted by the work yesterday at the gatehouse. We're in the process of installing a second gate arm in the guest lane. Our staff is working with a contractor on this project and the first phase was to install the sensors under the pavers. The pavers have also settled since installation in 2014, and we took this opportunity to fix them. The second gate arm is not activated by the member barcode, but will be a manual operation by staff. It will be mainly used in the evenings or on the weekends as needed when there are fewer staff on hand. And now on to a couple of community and golf projects. Uh, we have a contractor scheduled to be on site at the beginning of May for the approved drainage project along number six south in a section of Wax Myrtle Court. This project is to improve and reroute the drainage flow. This should also assist drainage in the stable gate area. It is difficult to say at this point how this will affect golf play, but maintenance will coordinate with the golf staff as needed if closures are warranted. The golf course irrigation pump station renovation has been completed with the exception of the electrical connection to some of our satellite stations. You may have seen our staff out with small generators running these satellite stations in the last couple of weeks in order to try to keep areas watered. The pump house renovation was an integral part of the upcoming irrigation system replacements on both golf courses. The south course irrigation is scheduled for 2022 and plans are currently out for bid on that project. The stormwater pond dredging project for 2021 has been completed. We thought this would be completed during the summer as we did our dredging project last year during the summer, but our contractor had a space open on their schedule and so it was great to go ahead and get this done. The pond that runs along number seven, eight, and nine south were dredged along with two areas along Wax Myrtle Court. Several of the spool bags have been removed and we realize there is some necessary cleanup work that has to be done and the others will be removed once they are dry. Maintenance is testing the spoilage and removing it to the maintenance area to be able to use for compost um, for other places in the community. If you've been to Mackey Creek Grill, you'll have seen the additional seating area that is being added. Our maintenance staff has done a great job of creating this natural seating area. The retaining wall and concrete paths have been completed. The first phase of the base is being added and then a small rock gravel base will be added to finish that off. The fire pit is on order with the contractor and we hope to be able to open this space up soon. We do have furniture on order for the site, but with all things COVID, shipping takes a while. If we are ready to open it before the furniture gets here, we have some additional pool furniture that we'll put out there so it will not delay um, using the space um, until the furniture gets here. Last but not least, I would like to update you on the clubhouse renovation project. The project team started meeting in mid-February. Our team includes our architects, 
contractor, interior design firm, certified kitchen designer, Jim O'Connor, our clubhouse manager, Chef Lenny, Pinkney Crosby, our facilities maintenance manager, and myself. Each time we have met, we have had all partners at the table. We have been working through the design phase and are nearing completion. The project involves the back of the house or kitchen redesign, adding a second cook line and the necessary equipment to operate member outside banquets, improving the operational flow of the kitchen, upgrading, replacing equipment as necessary. We're also improving and adding the necessary refrigeration and storage for the kitchen and clubhouse operations of our size. For the front of the house, we're working with the design and architect team to update the interiors and be able to offer additional casual seating areas. Our next step would be to start the costing process. We will be getting estimated budget costs for the kitchen, front of house, and also an alternative cost for improving the veranda. Once we receive the cost, the project would be presented to the board as we will have the plan, design elements, and cost at that time. By policy, a town hall meeting will be held for an opportunity for the membership to ask questions and provide input to the board. Now at this time, I would like to introduce our management team. We have a very qualified and long tenured management team. Many of you know them and have seen them around the community. Um, Jim Albano is our security chief. Tom Ruth is our director of tennis. Um, up until May 14th, so if you received the announcement yesterday, unfortunately Tom has um, resigned and is going to Long Cove Club, so uh, we're going to wish Tom and his family the best, but he will certainly be missed by all of you um, and the management team. Uh, we have already actively started recruiting for that um, position, so we will keep you updated on that. Um, Tom Logue, our director of golf. Karen Davidson, our human resource manager. Payman Shamlu, our controller. Jim O'Connor, our clubhouse manager. Lenny Giratano, our executive chef. Roger Ward, our water and utility manager. Mitchell Wick Wilkerson, director of golf and grounds maintenance. Pinkney Crosby, facilities maintenance manager. And Mike Palmeyer, our director of fitness and wellness. And now I will turn the meeting back over to Jenny. Thank you, Jay and Susanna. Many of you have asked about John Miller, our GM who is on extended medical leave. I'm happy to report he is home and recuperating nicely. And we expect to have him back in the office with us in the next few weeks. This wraps up our presentation. Remember to type your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom or top of your screen of your device. We're ready to take your questions and we'll start with questions that were sent in ahead of the meeting. All right, first one from Liz Hendry, 138 Toppen. The use of Boswick for exercise and yoga classes has truly enhanced the classes. No more crowding. I cannot imagine ever returning to that small exercise room in the main fitness building. Has anyone addressed the matter of additional storage at Boswick for the exercise bikes and other fitness equipment? It would seem that some type of storage facility could be created as an adjunct to the existing building. This will become necessary when Boswick is again used for social events. Thank you. Susanna, would you take that question, please? Well, that's a great question. And as we talked about earlier, the increase in fitness classes and the um, participation has certainly grown. Um, as Ms. Henry states, so, you know, there's a couple of issues at play. The classes have grown, um, which does pose an issue with move, moving them back to the fitness center. Um, if you've not been in that um, exercise room, she is correct. It is, um, it is a smaller room. Um, and of course, the other issue is if we leave the classes at Boster, where does the equipment get stored? Um, you know, as many of you know, the pavilion is used often for a lot of MCOA events, um, member events, club events, individual member events. And if we were to decide to keep the classes at the pavilion, we were to have to institute some sort of policy that would restrict member usage of that building certain days or times. Um, or the other option is the classes get moved back to the fitness center and they're limited in participation. 
Um, both of those um, are some growing pains for us and we're gonna have to address those as we move into further phases of reopening amenities. Um, the equipment storage is also a concern. You know, those spin bikes need to be kept in a control environment. Everything down there that's outside kept um, anywhere really rust. I don't know, you can just look at the bathroom doors and all kinds of things. It's just the, it's the air, it's the salt air coming off those pools and it's also um, the salt air co coming off the, uh, the water. Um, we, I don't know how, you know, management and the, the board would feel about adding a temporary storage shed. Not too crazy about that idea. Um, possibly there's some storage racks that are movable that could be used and rolled into the kitchen when not in use. But again, what happens when there's events in that building? So there's a lot of things for us to think about as we transition. I don't really have an answer today. Thanks, Susanna. Um, next question from Joe De Silva, 9 Wax Myrtle Lane. Has the board directed management to explore the possibility of securing a software change to the Mackey's Grill phone order app that would assist in controlling order flow and reinstitute the popular member feature from last season? Joe, thank you for asking that question because it gives us an opportunity to do a couple things. First of all, to clarify the role of the board and management. Um, the board does not direct management in terms of day-to-day -day operations, and this is clearly an operational issue. So I'll ask Susanna Johnston to give you an update on where we are and why the changes have been made to the app and what the future holds. So Susanna, would you handle that, please? Well, I think as we discussed at the last town hall meeting and several times in our communications, um, the reality is that the facility, Mackey Creek Grill, is a food truck. It has limitations. Um, the ordering app was discontinued as at wait times last year, some of them were averaging 75 to 80 minutes. We had orders coming from your homes. We had people on the pool deck ordering. We had people in person ordering and it was just flooded into that facility. Um, a lot of you probably have a bigger kitchen in your home that's in, that's in that facility. So even if we had software that would be able to control the order flow as suggested, um, with a food truck is pretty much impossible because you've got orders coming in, you're trying to control the flow and now you've got 10 people lined up trying to place their order in person. Um, so it, it's difficult. Um, Interestingly enough, the average food truck has about five to 12 items that they sell and specialize in. We have over 24 items on our menu, plus add-on options and drinks. So it is a limit, it is offering a lot. It's doing business or it's obviously not suffering, um, but there are limitations to that. And we realize that, and I know um, the worst thing you can do is offer something and take it back. And, you know, we tried that during COVID. We were trying to be proactive. Fortis came up with something new. We just realized as we got through the season that it was just not working for our facility. Um, and I'd just like to remind everybody that the clubhouse is available for to-go orders at all times. So that's where we would, if you want to call from home and pick something up, we would suggest that you use the clubhouse for that. Okay, thank you, Susanna. Um, the next question is from Flip Cummins, 37 Timberlane, and he asks, are there any plans to update the online member roster? Just wondering if there's a way to get more current photos online and how do members update their information? Susanna, would you take that one, please? Yes, and Jenny, you might not know this, but Flip is a missus. So Ms. Cummins, I uh, thank you for your, uh, your question. And I believe what you're asking, so the member roster is updated, but I believe what you're asking is for the photos. So those photos are photos that come straight out of our point of sale system. Um, and when we got this system back in 2010, I believe we had a company come in and do a lot of um, portrait photos photos of the membership. And so those photos were um, loaded into our system and those get loaded up into the member roster. If you wanna change your photo, add a photo, um, 
change your email, add anything about what is on your profile. If you go to your profile, you just there's a little pencil. You just click on that. You can edit whatever you want to edit. Um, that goes to administration for us to approve, and then it gets edited. So I think there's two parts is how, how does she edit her profile, but also would we, you know, maybe in the future decide to have a company like that come back, do photos of the membership for uploading into the POS system. So I hope I've answered that, Ms. Cummins. If I haven't, send me an email. Okay, thank you, Susanna. And I apologize, Ms. Cummins. I didn't know that. Um, next question from Sam Newman. What part of the developing plan for modification of the clubhouse will members vote on? Sam, thanks for that question. Um, it's a good one. Actually, our governing documents do not provide for members voting on the clubhouse in this instance. What it does provide for, what they do provide for, as Susanna mentioned earlier, is a town hall meeting where members will get to see the plans and will be have plenty of time for questions and comments on the plans and to give input to um, administration and to the board on that. So that's that's where we are with that one. Now I apologize to everybody ahead of time. I'm going to have to reach up over my screen to scroll other questions. Okay, we don't have any open questions. So we'll give it another couple minutes to see if questions come in. Surely we can't have answered everybody's questions and just those four. And I also understand that we're competing with the verdict on the Derek Chauvin trial, which is coming up right soon. So I understand we've got a little competition here for airtime. While we're waiting for some questions, Jenny, I do want to remind the membership that we do have a link in our weekly e-blast and many of you have already seen it. We will be hosting a town hall meeting next Wednesday. Um, Mike Morn with Club Benchmarking will be presenting um, the results of the membership satisfaction survey. So you will certainly want to register for that. Um, like I said, if you have not already registered, the link will again be in the e-blast on Thursday. And we encourage everyone to be able to get on and hear those results. That meeting will be at 5.30 p.m. We will also be recording that and posting to the website. Great, thanks, Susanna. Okay, we do have another question from Debbie Dunlap. She states, our golf courses are in the worst shape we have seen since living here. I do realize that because of COVID, the courses have seen so much play, but all of the local courses have had the same problem, but their courses have grass on the fairways. Having a green patch to hit off of is a rarity. Why has this happened? So Susanna, would that be yours? Um, I'll take a shot at it. And then Susanna, you can uh, fill in. How's that? OK. Um, I think there are a couple of contributing factors. One, we've had a very dry stretch. Two, with our single player to a single cart, our courses are taking a double the beating um, as when we're playing two cards to a foursome, now we have four. And third, recently, combining with a lack of rain, we did have the pump replacement project ongoing, and it took a little longer than we had hoped. So we were not pumping the water we normally do. Um, I, those are those sound like excuses. They're sort of explanations. The third, the the fourth factor is that our courses are coming up on their long-term capital. Uh, regrassing and resodding, uh, and hopefully the South Course. I think Suzanne is scheduled for 2022. It's been a decade. Um, I think that will, those that will improve the quality of the grasses as well. Do you have anything to add? No, I don't. It's 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 you know it's unfortunate with the the, the warm temperatures we've had and the pump house renovation and um, but that is up and running now as of last week. So. Hopefully we can get those satellites also. I know the back nine of the South is struggling a little bit due to that. Um, that's one of the areas they're having to go out and use the generators to, to hand water those areas. So, um, and, but it's just, you know, the astronomical use as well. And you can add to that, unfortunately, um, people apparently were not bringing their own receptacles for sand to fill the divots. 
And I've never seen a winter in which we had fewer divots, divots filled by members, which you know, ultimately uh, causes playability issues as well. Okay, thank you both. We have two more questions from Tracy Hogan. Can we make our amenities more accessible specifically the fishing docks, dog park, and some of the pool features. Susanna? I'm thinking uh -huh. that she um, is talking about maybe um, handicap accessible. Obviously all those are in the, in the word accessible, they are accessible to everyone, but I'm assuming she's thinking more um, handicap features um, and you know, the, we do have a um, entry level pool. Um, we have um, handicap ramps all the way up into the pool facility. Um, I have had some requests for us to review the fishing docks and the dog park um, for access, um, which I, I do have that on my list, so. Okay, and if that's not the answer that you were looking for in terms of, uh, the intent of the question, um, put it up again, please. And we'll give it another shot. Yeah, or send me an email with some suggestions. I'm happy to respond to that as well. Okay, so either way. Um, another from Liz Henry. When Tom Ruth was hired, a small group of us were able to audition him. He gave us a clinic so we could evaluate his skills and personality. Will we have that ability with the new candidates for the tennis pros job? Susanna? Um, you know, we just uh, started this process yesterday. I, I do not know the answer to that question. Um, you know, it was a different um, management team here when um, Tom was hired. Um, while I don't think this is a bad idea, um, I certainly just don't have the answer to that. And we're certainly taking the comment into consideration. Um, and uh, do so if it, if it makes sense to do so. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions. We'll give it a minute. Sometimes it's kind of hard to type all these in and we don't want to miss anybody's question if they have one. There's one more that came in um, from Marilyn. Yeah. From Marilyn Yantis, with all our financial engines, home sales, government loans forgiven, and golf rounds, rounds increased, et cetera, in the positive, why are we so frugal with our expenditures? Is saving $75,000 for both golf and clubhouse budgets? Why don't we improve and enhance our quality of life in Moss Creek? Thanks again, Brian Yantis. 12 Longleaf. All right, who would like to take this one? I'm assuming they're um, mentioning, uh, discussing that um, ma ma management was asked last year when we, during the budget process to cut out $75,000 in the golf course budget expenditures and in the clubhouse budget expenditures, um, which we did. Um, we felt that was um, prudent to do based on the um, direction from the finance committee. So um, as we look at budgets for 2022, if, if we are given um, areas to increase that, those budgets, we'll, we will. We'll review areas that we decreased and see if we have um, not been able to meet the member experience by doing so. Um, and, you know, we'll review that at budget time. Okay, thank yeah, I'll you. add to that, Susanna, that um, I think that when, you, when your business is primarily providing services and experiences to your membership, you can't cut your way to success. And, and, I, and I don't disagree with Brian's long-term concern that if we keep cutting, the member experience would suffer more seriously. So I don't have any intent at this point to make cuts just for their, you know, the percentage cuts just for the sake of making cuts. We will spend the money we need to spend 
and we will make the budget decisions necessary to enhance the member experience, not to detract from it. Good, thank you, Jay. Thank you, Susanna. Um, Ms. Huggins said, yes, handicapped accessible pool example would be a lift and automatic doors on the washrooms. And she'll follow up with you, Susanna. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. All right. We have one from Janet Kelly. Will we be having service at the bag drop soon as people start riding two to a cart and staff it, and less staff is needed for cart turnover? Susanna? Um, yes, all the, as we start moving two to a card, as we start moving to um, uh, opening up, uh, right now it's, it's voluntary two to a card. There will be a time when it's going to be mandatory two to a card. Um, and when we open up bag storage, as we move towards that, yes, Kel Ms. Kelly, we will have service at the bag drop. Okay. We have had, I believe, um, We've had a pretty a pretty good um, response to Tom's uh, questionnaire about would you use bag storage if it was back? And so, um, you know, that's one of the things that we are continuing every week to look at and review as to when is the proper time to bring that back. Um, and, you know, as we move into May and June. Okay, right now we have no open questions. We'll give it one more minute and then we'll assume that we've answered your questions. But if you have questions that did not get answered or you couldn't get them all typed in fast enough, please do send us emails. You can either send them to me or Susanna, either one. And if they're for Jay, we'll get them over to Jay. Okay, there are no more questions. So thank you for coming. Thank you for being such uh, patient listeners and thanks for having questions. Moss Creek's a special place. We're all very lucky to be here. And we're very lucky to have had a staff that helped us get through COVID safely. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing you all again later this month for the results of the membership survey. And I think you'll find that very interesting. I certainly have. So we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks for your time. Good night.